going to start with number 2 in 4.3. Give us a triangle. Uh, it's a right triangle. Here's the angle. So this would be the opposite side, or it's across. Opposite the angle this is next to or adjacent. This would be the hypotenuse up here. And Okay, so what are they asking? They say... Find the exact values of the six, six trigonometric functions. So those would be sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Um, so if we look at the angle here, what's the sign? It's the opposite over the hypotenuse. So that would be 5 over 13. Um, well, then we could also do the, uh, the cosecant, right? Because that's just the hypotenuse over the opposite, or the reciprocal of the sine. 13 over 5. But now, um, we don't, like, if you go to try to do the cosine, say, uh, you do the adjacent over the hypotenuse, but you don't have the adjacent side. Um, but we do know that this side plus this, or this side squared plus this side squared equals 13 squared. So we could say a squared plus 5 squared equals 13 squared. Um, so uh, a squared equals, I'm going to subtract 25 squared from both sides, and I'll at the same time, I'll look at 13 squared. It's 169 minus 5 squared, which is 25. That's 144. Okay, I might want to write 144 here, but remember that's a squared. That's the value of this side when you square it. Uh, and the square root then of 144 would be 12. So there we go. Now we have the, eva the, uh, the value of the adjacent side, so we could go with uh, cosine, or any other value now. The cosine would be adjacent over hypotenuse, that would be 12 over 13. Once you find the cosine, you could go right to the secant, because it's just the reciprocal. That's 13 over 12. Do the tangent. The tangent is, f is opposite over adjacent, that's 5 over 12. And the cotangent would just be the reciprocal, 12 over 5. All right, um, now we'll do number 9. Number 9. Uh, they want us to sketch uh, a right triangle that uh, corresponds or, or fits with uh, this, that the sine of some angle is equal to 5 sixths, 5 over 6. Um, and, uh, and basically use a triangle to find all of the, si of the, the trig values, sine, cosine, and, and so on. Um, so first, let's draw ourselves a little triangle here, okay, a right triangle. Let's throw the, the angle down here. This is just how I standard draw every right triangle I ever draw, is just uh, uh, an angle over here, angle here, right angle over here, about these proportions. Um, you could draw any way you want. We could have chosen theta up there. It doesn't matter. Uh, we want this angle to have a sine of 5 over 6. So uh, if the sine turns out to be 5 over 6, the opposite over the hypotenuse would turn out to be 5 over 6. We could just take 5 to be the opposite side and 6 to be the hypotenuse. So the sine would be 5 over 6. Um, we could also make this 10 and 12. That would give us a sine of 5 over 6, but that's the simplest way to go. Um, then we can find this other side. We could say that a squared plus 5 squared equals 6 squared, or 6 squared minus 5 squared equals a squared. That's 36 minus 25 equals a squared. Uh, 36 minus 25 is 11. Okay, That's a squared. So we need to take the square root of 11, so the square root of 11 is this other side. Now we use the information they gave us that the sine is 5 6. We made a triangle that has a, uh, an angle uh, with a sine of 5 over 6 and then we found the other side to be the square root of 11. And now we can do everything. We can do this. The, if we have the sine we can easily do the cosecant. That's going to be the reciprocal. That's 6 over 5. Uh, we can do the cosine. That's adjacent over hypotenuse. That's root 11 over 6. We could do the secant. 
which would be the reciprocal, would be 6 over root 11. But then we do that uh, rationalizing the denominator thing, where we multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of 11. Why? Because uh, when you multiply the square root of 11 times the square root of 11, you just get 11. And up here we get 6 times the square root of 11. And again, that comes from uh, the days of slide rules, which were before calculators, I mean before any calculators, not just graphing calculators, but uh, the cheapest, chintziest calculator uh, that you could think of. They came free because you opened a bank account or something. Um, that was more sophisticated than um, what they were working with uh, back in the day of slide rules. Uh, so even before the cheapest of calculators, they used slide rules, and slide rules could not divide by the square root of 11. Uh, so there you go. I, really, I think a slide rule is probably more sophisticated than the calculator you could get with a bank account, but uh, they still they didn't exist. The first calculators that did pretty simple, maybe, maybe a scientific type calculator, uh, of, oh man, I think they cost close to a thousand dollars to have one of those, so um, so wow, history and stuff. Uh, so this, the tangent is the opposite over the hypotenuse is 5 over root 11, and we rationalize the denominator, we get 5 root 11 over 11, and then the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of the tangent, we could just take the reciprocal of this guy here and get root 11 over 5. All right. Um, and onward. After number 9, we'll do number 16. Similar kind of a deal, the sine of an angle is equal to 3 over 8. Okay, so we'll draw ourselves a triangle. Here's the angle, the sine is 3 over 8. We could do 8 squared minus 3 squared is equal to a squared. So that's 64 minus 9 equals a squared. That's 55 equals a squared, and that's the square root of 55 equals a. So the square root of 55. Uh, we got the sine, we could do the cosecant. That's 8 over 3. You can do the cosine. We can see that here. That's the square root of 55 Go over 8. The secant. Uh, it's just going to be the reciprocal of this. It's going to be 8 over the square root of 55. Then we rationalize the denominator. Now we can use our slide rules to calculate an approximation of that guy there. Um, tangent is going to be 3 over root 55. Then we rationalize the denominator. get 3 root 55 over 55. And then we can do the cotangent, which is the reciprocal of the tangent, which is going to be root 55 over 3. All right. And on to 44. So they tell us that the sine of 30 is equal to 1 half. Um, and the tangent of 30 is equal to root 3 over 3. So they want us to find the cosecant. cosecant. Well, the cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine, so we could just take the reciprocal of the sine, and so the cosecant of 30 degrees is the reciprocal of the sine, so that's going to be 2 over 1, or just 2. Um, that was part A. Part B is the cotangent of 60. Um, so the cotangent of 60, we could think back to um, you know, that triangle that we had a while back. It was like this. And we made this 60 and this 30. Um, and we found this to be 1, and this was 2, and this was the square root of 3. And we determined that the, say, um, the sine of 30, which is one opposite over um, 
hypotenuse. Uh, well, that one side is opposite 30, but it's adjacent to 60, so the cosine of 60 would be 1 over 2. Right. So um, we could look at what is the, uh, let's see, go back to 44b, the cotangent of 60. Um, so the cotangent of, of 60, which would be not opposite over adjacent, but adjacent over opposite, uh, which is uh, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, uh, and that's so that when we rationalize the denominator here, we get root 3 over 3. Uh, the, or we could think the cotangent, the adjacent over the, uh, over the opposite, is the same as the opposite over adjacent for 30, the opposite over adjacent, or the tangent for 30 is root 3 over 3, uh, and so the cotangent of 60 is root 3 over 3. It's the same as the tangent of 30. Uh, the cosine of 30, um, we, I guess we could just draw out this, uh, this triangle, um, and which we've done. The cosine of 30 would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which would be root 3 over 2. Um, and part D, the cotangent of 30, uh, well that's just 1 over the tangent of 30, and that would be 1 over root 3 over 3. When you divide by a, uh, a fraction, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, so multiply 1 by 3 over root 3. And when you rationalize the denominator, we get root, or get three root three over three. The root, or the threes cancel, and we get the square root of three. The cotangent is the square root of three. Uh, we could have also just taken the tangent and flipped it over and had three root three, uh, just a little bit sooner. Uh, but however you choose. Um, so that's forty-four, forty-nine. Tangent of theta, cotangent of theta equals 1. So what they want us to do is to take one side of the equation and turn it into the right side. So um, the main rule here is don't like add something to both sides or divide both sides by something. You have to change the left side to look like the right side or change the right side to look like the left side or change both sides individually uh, to look like each other. Um, so, yeah, that's that's something that we can do. So, how are we going to make ta tangent time cotangent equal 1? Uh, well, the cotangent is just, let's write the tangent, the cotangent is just 1 over the tangent. And when we multiply these together, they cancel out. We get 1, and there you go, that's 1. 1 equals 1. Um, now, 53... We have 1 plus cosine theta times 1 minus cosine theta equals sine squared. Okay. In doing this and trying to make one side look like the other, usually the more complicated looking side is easier to simplify and make look like this than it is to try and make this more complicated. So if we just take this and somehow make it into the sine squared of theta. Um, what I notice here is that these are conjugates. Um, what you might remember from uh, irrational conjugates and from complex conjugates is when we multiply them together, um, since one is positive and one is negative, we get some kind of uh, cancellation, and, uh, and this whole thing kind of becomes a little bit simpler. So if we do that, let's see what happens. Uh, we get one times one is one. Then you get negative cosine when you multiply these together. You get positive cosine when you multiply these together. Uh, so negative cosine plus cosine is nothing. Then cosine times negative cosine is negative cosine squared theta equals sine squared theta. Well, if you'll remember, let's make a little memory cloud here. We remember things in light blue clouds. Uh, there was that Pythagorean identity that said sine squared plus cosine squared equals.
equals 1. Now if we subtract cosine squared from both sides, we see that 1 minus cosine squared is equal to sine squared theta. So when we come back up in here, we say, well, 1 minus cosine squared is the same as sine squared theta. And so we have done it. We've made one side look like the other. Um, I was going to not do another one of these, but let's do another one of these. 55. Um, the sine of theta over the cosine of theta plus the cosine of theta over the sine of theta equals the cosecant of theta times the secant of theta. Alright, so which side to make look like the other side? I'm going to say, let's put these together. Right? Let's take these two fractions, add them together, uh, and maybe we'll be closer to this. Um, uh, by add them together, I mean we need to find a common denominator, right? So uh, our common denominator will be sine times cosine. There's not much of a better way to do it. So sine times cosine will be our common denominator, which means we need to mul multiply this by cosine over cosine. Uh, or no, this needs to be multiplied by sine over sine. So let's undo all that. This needs to multiply by sine sine of theta, and this needs to be multiplied by sine of theta. And over here, we need to multiply sine by cosine, and which means we need to multiply the numerator by cosine as well. So we get sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, because sine times sine is co or sine squared, cosine times cosine is cosine squared, over the common denominator, cosine theta sine theta. Uh, so look, this identity is coming up again. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. So 1 over cosine theta sine theta. Um, well, I see I have two terms times each other. I have two terms times each other here. What if I split this apart into 1 over cosine times 1 over sine? Well, what's 1 over cosine? 1 over cosine is the secant. 1 over sine is the secant, or is the cosecant. So secant times cosecant, cosecant times secant, it's the same. It's just in a different order. Uh, so there we did it again. Right? If you have two fractions, try to add them together. Uh, if you've got two things multiplied together and it seems like it gets simpler, try and maybe turn one of them into a fraction and maybe something will cross cancel. Um, all sorts of little different ideas come to mind. Okay. Uh, now, 57. Uh, A, the sine of 41. So what are we doing here? We're using a calculator to evaluate each function. So we'll get our calculator. Uh, so we're going to use our calculator to uh, calculate these values. Um, the sine of 41. So here's the sine button. And we put in 41, and uh, we would probably just press enter, except for we just... Remember, there's two different ways to measure angles uh, that we know about so far. Uh, one of them degrees, one of them radians. You'll notice, when I put this in the calculator, the calculator can do both radians and degrees. How do I tell it that it's degrees and not radians, or vice versa? Um, this is degrees, so how do I tell it I'm putting degrees into the sign and it's not 41 radians? Well, I need to change the mode, if necessary, the mode of the calculator. And look, it is in radian de uh, mode. So we'll put it in degree mode. Now it's ready. Now it knows that that thing right there, it knows that, that when I say sine, it should anticipate some angle being in there, the sine of some angle. And so that angle, it now knows is in degrees. And when I press Enter, I'm sure I have the right thing. So uh, it also says uh, four decimal places. So 0.6561. Okay. Um, now we'll do part B. It wants us to find the cosine of 87. Okay, so cosine of 87, and I know it's still in degree mode from the last problem that we did. So 0.0523. So 
so there we go. We'll do another one kind of like that, uh, 61. Hopefully you notice the difference right away. Part A is the cotangent of pi over 16. Okay. Now to be fair, we could, it could be pi over 16 degrees. Pi over 16 is just a number. In fact, pi over 16 uh, is, is 0.1963 whatever. Why, you know, why couldn't it be 0 0.1963 degrees? It could be. Um, no reason it couldn't be. But it's, I know it's not in degrees. Why is it not in degrees? Why is this in degrees and this isn't? This says degrees, this doesn't. So uh, we can assume it's in radians. The pi also kind of uh, clues us in that the person who wrote this meant radians. They also didn't put a degree sign, so that's uh, uh, doubly uh, proof that we're in radians. So if you want the cotangent, now that's a little tricky. If you look at your three trig buttons here on your calculator, and pretty much on any calculator, uh, you'll see sine, cosine, tangent. Uh, you don't see secant, cosecant, and cotangent. The reason being, that would be a total waste of buttons. You only need these three because the other three are just uh, the reciprocals of these, right? Like one over the sine, well, that's the cosecant. One over the cosine, that's the secant. One over the tangent, that's the cotangent. So we'll just do one over the tangent of pi over 16. Okay, so one over the tangent of pi over 16 would be the cotangent of pi over 16 radians, right? Uh, that many radians. So we need to make sure we're in radian mode, which we aren't, of course. We put it in degree mode just a minute ago. Now we're in radian mode, and we'll hit enter, and there we go. 5.0273. 5.0273. B, we are looking for the tangent of pi over 8. Okay, so now we have the tangent of pi over 8, 0.4142. All right. So now we'll do number 72. Um, all right, so I'll have to draw this out. Let's assume that's the right triangle. This is 38. This is they call x. This they call y. This is 30 degrees. And they say find x and y. Um, no. Find x and r. Which did I draw? That's 38. That's x. Oh. This is R, for one thing. Uh, bear with me here. This is R. This should be 60 degrees. OK, there we go. 60 degrees. So uh, we want to find x, and we want to find r. Um, well, we could th we're thinking maybe we could use the, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, but we only have one side. We don't have two sides. That's for when we have two sides and we want to find a third side. And we don't have two sides, we have one side. But we do have this angle. Um, and we do have its opposite side. So let's think, like the, the sine of 60 is the opposite. The sine of any angle is the opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, for this case that would be uh, 38 degrees, or th sorry, 38 uh, just whatever. doesn't say what it is, feet or whatever. It's 38 over uh, r. So the sine of 60 is 38 over r. Um, there's also the tangent. The tangent of 60 is opposite over adjacent, which would be 38 over x. Okay. And here's the cool thing. We know what 60 is, or the sine of 60, what the tangent of 60 is. Uh, so we could use either one of these we want. We could solve for r, we could solve for x. Um, let's use uh, the sine of 60. We know the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2. So that's equal to 38 over r. Um, 
So we could uh, do this cross multiplication thing, right? R times the square root of 3 is equal to 2 times 38. So that's going to be 76. And to solve for R, we got to divide by root 3 on both sides. Okay, it's good enough for me, good enough for Mr. Stewart's class, but uh, not good enough for NASA. So we're going to multiply by the square root of 3. Uh, in both places, so we get 76 root 3 over 3. And if 76 were divisible by 3, we would simplify that, but it's not, so we'll leave it alone. Um, so this is 76, or no, this is r. So this is 76 root 3 over 3. Um, and now we could do Pythagorean theorem if we wanted to. But to square this guy, we know that's going to be involved. That would be uh, kind of crazy. So maybe you want to do that. Maybe you don't. Um, I would just uh, as soon uh, use this equation here to solve for x. Uh, I know that the tangent of 60 is uh, root 3, so the square root of 3. And that's equal to 38 over x. Multiply both sides by x. You get x times the square root of 3 equals 38. Square root of 3 divided by square root of 3 on both sides. So we get x equals 38 over the square root of 3. We rationalize the denominator. We get 38 root 3 over 3. And so this is 38 root 3 over 3. Um, that's, uh, that's it for that question, I think, just finding x and r. Um, yeah, that was it. Um, so, maybe you missed that, kind of, or something. So we'll do it again. We'll do another one, just like that, 74. stuff. 74. This is y. This is r. This is 10. And this is 45. This is your right angle right here. So we're supposed to find y and r. Um, this couldn't be much easier because we know that a 45 uh, degree angle here would mean that this has to be 45 as well since all of these have to add up to 180. In a 45-45-90 uh, triangle, the two legs are the same, so this would be 10. Um, this would be a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or x squared plus y squared equals r squared. 10 squared plus 10 squared equals r squared. So 100 plus 100, that's 200, equals r squared. We take the square root of 200, that's r. We can split this up into the square root of 100 times the square root of 2. The square root of 100 is 10 the square root of 2, that's equal to r. So this could be 10 root 2. Um, we could also, um, if we were to start all over again and um, we didn't think of that, we could do this is 45, and this is y, and this is 10, and this is r. Uh, we could just, uh, if we hadn't thought of that 45 degree angle thing there, we could say, uh, we've got this adjacent side, um, so how about the tangent of 45 is equal to the opposite y over 10, the adjacent side, opposite over adjacent. We know the tangent of 45 is 1. If you turn back to page uh, 279 in your, your books that we're using this year, um, then you'll see that the tangent is 1. So 1 equals y over 10. So we can see that y is 10 when you multiply by 10 both sides. So y is 10. Uh, and then we could just use Pythagorean theorem there. That'd be simple enough. Maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we want to test our, our skills. So maybe we'll say that the, um, let's see, the secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. The secant, secant of 45 degrees is equal to r over 10. And we go back over to 279, uh, we won't find the secant, but we will find the cosine, which is the reciprocal. So if the cosine is 
root 2 over 2, then the secant is 1 over root 2 over 2, and that's r over 10. Um, and then 1 over this fraction would be the reciprocal, right? Multiply by the reciprocal. So we get 2 times, or 2 over root 2 equals uh, r over 10. We'll multiply by 10 on both sides and get 10 times 2 over root 2. We'll rationalize the denominator. We'll multiply by root 2 and both the numerator and denominator. We'll get 10 times 2 times root 2 over 2. 2's cancel, 10 root 2. could have done the same kind of a thing. Instead of using the secant, we could have said that the cosine of 45 is equal to 10 over r, and uh, just gone from there, um, whichever makes more sense to you. But there you go. That's 74, several different options. the last one. The last one we'll do. Uh, 77. Uh, a six-foot person walks from the base of a street light directly toward the tip of the shadow cast by the street light. When the person is 16 feet from the street light and five feet from the street light shadow, the person's shadow uh, starts to appear beyond the street light shadow. Um, let's see person is 16 feet from the street light and 5 feet from the tip of the street light shadow, the person's shadow starts to appear beyond the street light shadow. So draw a right triangle that gives a visual representation of the problem, show the known quantities, and use variables to indicate the height of the street light. Wow. Um, so first we'll draw a, a street So there we go. Here's our street light that we just drew. And now we'll draw a man who's walking away from it. Uh, maybe we will. Let's see. I think now we can. There we go. He's a blue man. And he is walking away from the street light. And, uh, and I think the thing to understand is that this is probably happening during the day because they both have shadows. Uh, so here's the streetlight's shadow. It's a little past his shadow. Uh, so the sun is shining down. The sun. There's the sun. It's shining down and it's casting a shadow uh, like that, right? Um, and I guess what we should have drawn, let's just draw this a little bit differently. Uh, and you'll see why I'm doing this. I'm having it go right across his head. And then we'll have his shadow like this. Because what it says is that at uh, a certain point, uh, in fact, when he's 16 feet from the street light uh, and 5 feet from the tip of the street light shadow, the person's shadow starts to appear beyond the streetlight shadow. So at this moment, his his shadow starts to go past the streetlight shadow. So I should uh, make that even more clear, even less confusing. Right. The streetlight shadow goes right up to there. His shadow is right up on the tip of the uh, of the streetlight shadow, and uh, and so that's what we know. We don't even know what we want to know. Um, what they say is that he's 16 feet from the streetlight, and that, that he's 5 feet from the tip of the shadow of the streetlight. So he's 5 feet from the tip of the shadow. So from here to there is 5 feet. From here to here is 16 feet. Um, so that's what they're saying. So when he's 16 feet from the streetlight and 5 feet from the tip of the streetlight shadow, his shadow starts to go past the streetlight shadow. And it says to uh, use a variable to represent the height of the street light. So there we go. There's part A. Part B, we're going to use trig functions or a trig function to write an equation involving the unknown quantity. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. 
let's assume that this is a nice straight up and down uh, street light that uh, you know doesn't have this piece hanging off so that we could make a perfect triangle out of this um, I guess we could draw a line like this it's straight down from there instead of this other one what a good choice I made in street lights um, so now we want to use a trig function to represent the uh, height of the street light. So if we call this guy here, this angle theta, then we could say that the tangent of theta is equal to x, equal to x over 16 plus 5, that'd be 21. Um, and then we just need to find uh, what x is if we want to know the height of the street light. So use the true function to write an equation. Okay, what is the height of the street light? Um, now we don't have this angle theta. We don't know what it is. Um, let's see. Ah, but we know this guy is six feet tall. Ah. So, now we don't need to know what the angle is, because we do know the tangent of the angle is uh, six over five, right? This, this angle is actually in two different triangles. This little one here involving the guy, and this big one involving the street light. So the tangent of that angle is six over five. So six over five is the same as x over 21. So we can multiply both sides by 21. 21 times 6 fifths equals x. And since this is just some uh, numerical quantity, a number of feet, we'll just go ahead and throw that in the old calculator. Uh, 21 times 6 over 5, 25.2. So x is 25.2. It's 25.2 feet high. All right, there you go. You you saw it with your own eyes, the struggle and everything uh, that I went through, um, realizing that we had the, the guy's height the whole time. And so now we can express uh, the tangent of this angle as uh, a, an actual number, right? Six over, uh, six over five. So there you go. There's an example. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thanks for watching.